All right, Job chapter 32. I'll begin reading at verse 1, and I'll read to verse 1, meaning I'll start with verse 1. In Job chapter 32, verse 1, it reads, So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Now in chapter 31, chapter 31 closed with the words, and you see it just above verse 1, the words of Job ended. And so chapter 31 closed by saying the words of Job are ended. That meant that he closed the words of his argument for the time being. He had finished his argument with uh, Aliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, the three friends that are so pronounced throughout the, uh, the book of, uh, of Job. The rest of the book is going to contain things that a young man by the name of Elihu says. It's also going to contain things that God himself will say to Job. Now, as we've been going through the book of Job, throughout this book, Job has been defending his own integrity. We've seen this. He has presented his testimony to his friends, and they hadn't been able to refute him. He had consistently defended his own character, and they could not reply to what he had to say. Now, as we went through chapter 31, let me remind you that Job once again had claimed to be a righteous man. And he said it like this. He said, I've never lusted after a woman. I haven't lived as a hypocrite. I've never abused my authority over my servants, never kept the poor from their basic necessities, never held back good from widows. I've never trusted in my wealth, never rejoiced at the destruction of enemies, and I've never given in to pressure to cover up and to hide my sin. So he was speaking concerning, and we saw that in chapter 31, concerning his righteousness. He's saying, I have lived a very high standard of righteousness. I'm a righteous man. I've lived a life of integrity. Like it says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 7, the righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. So he's claiming to be a righteous man, one of integrity. Well, the result of what Job had said was for Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar to stop speaking to him. They've had enough. And they're giving up now. They're giving up trying to reason with him. They thought they were wasting their time. They thought that Job actually was being foolish. Again, in Proverbs 18, verse 2, it says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And that's how they're looking at Job at that time. As far as they could see, Job is righteous in his own eyes. They couldn't reach him. They had exhausted all of their arguments. And that's what it says in verse 1. These three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Well, it goes on and it speaks of, uh, well, it speaks in this way, verse 2. It says, Then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakal, the Bazite, and the family of Ram was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet condemned Job. And so we are now introduced to uh, someone by the name of Elihu. It gives us his heritage. His, his, he is the son of Barakal, who was what is called a Buzite or a Buzite. And so the word Elihu, the name literally means he is my God, Elihu, and he's a buzz, buzzite. Now, a buzzite is an interesting man. Uz, <laughs> I don't know. I want to say something dumb. I'm going to, I think. Because <laughs> Uz and Buzz, I mean, think about that. That was their name, Uz and Buzz. Uh, anyway, uh, Uz and Buzz were sons of Abraham's brother, Nahor. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 20 and 21, it says, Soon after this, Abraham heard that Milcah, his brother Nahor's wife, had borne Nahor eight sons. The oldest was named Uz, the next oldest, Buzz, <laughs> I'm sorry, followed by Cal, etc. So, Uz and Buzz. It would seem that Alihu had been present during this discussion. He's just unnamed. Because you're going to see it in a minute. He's going to be responding and speaking and quoting Job. So it seems that he had been present 
but he had not yet spoken. And so when it says in verse 2, the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachal, the Buzzite, of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job, his wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. And so Job had come close to claiming that God was unjust and wrong. We know that as we've gone through the book of Job, that Job has felt unfairly treated, but he has not crossed that line. He has not claimed that God was completely wrong and that God was unjust. We'll see that in chapter 42. If you take notes, you might want to note this. In chapter 42, verse 7, it will say, It was so that after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends. For you have spoken of me the thing that is, have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. And so Job had gotten close to um, crossing the line by saying God was wrong and God was unjust, but he didn't cross that line. And so he, he, he felt that Job had been treated in a certain way and it bothered him. In, in verse 3, it says also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet condemned Job. And so he was angry also because Job's friends could not convince Job of his guilt. They'd been silenced and had no response, but they were not personally convinced that Job was innocent. In other words, they hadn't won the argument, but they're still condemning Job. But they couldn't prove he's guilty, but maintained that he was but they had no proof. So he's angry. He's angry because it appears that Job is righteous in his own eyes, but it also appears that his friends were incompetent, and that's why Elihu decides to step in to the argument. It says in verse 4, Now, because they were years older than he, Elihu had waited to speak to Job. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused. And so, out of respect, and we'll look at this in just a moment, out of respect, he as a younger man had waited for the elders to finish speaking. But he was dissatisfied with what they were saying, and so now he's going to offer his own speech. It says in verse 6, Eliu, the son of Barakah, the Bazite, answered and said, I'm young in years, and you are very old. Therefore, I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said age should speak. Multitude of years should teach wisdom. And so he begins to speak here. And then it's interesting how he begins to speak and the things that he begins to say. Notice how it speaks of him being young in years. His exact age is unknown. But so is Job's and so are his friends. But it seems, even as he says that, that some of Job's friends may have been older than, than uh, Job was, um, because we see in Job chapter 15, verse 10, uh, Alphas said, the gray-haired and the aged on our, on our side, men even older than your father. So it seems that there was a number of men there that were there, and perhaps even amongst his three friends who were older than Job. And so this young man is listening. And so the speech of the elder should take precedence over the thoughts of the young. Age should speak, and youth should listen, and youth should learn. In Job chapter 12, verse 12, Job had said, Wisdom is with the aged men, and with length of days, understanding. And so just touching on that for just a moment, we need to remember that there's a difference in accumulating information there's a difference between accumulating information and having wisdom. I think that's appropriate to say, especially in this age, because it's kind of obvious that prior to the, um, the use of the Internet and the use of uh, being able to Google pretty much anything you want, uh, people actually used to study before they spoke. People actually went to college or took, uh, took classes before they developed opinions that they felt were equal to the others. That's not true today, not like it used to be. Uh, what is true today is we have instant information at our fingertips, 
And because we're able to repeat what somebody else wrote, we think that we know what it's meant by what somebody else wrote, which is not true. What we're basically doing is just quoting somebody else's experience. In the older days, and in these days, no, he knew, Elihu knew. He said, I'm a young man, you're old. I was afraid, dared not declare my opinion. I said, age should speak. Multitude of years should teach wisdom. The natural way for me to, to learn would be to learn from the ancients, to learn from the older, to, to learn from the elder, to learn from the experienced, to learn from the person who knows, the one who's lived. And uh, that's something that was acknowledged then. Again, there's a difference between accumulating information but actually having true wisdom. Uh, true wisdom is defined, basically, wisdom is defined as having a skill in life, living a skillful life, taking in information and growing in understanding, putting it into practice, gaining through experience a skill in living. That's called wisdom. And those who have grown older and those who have walked with God should be a treasury of wisdom. Like it says in Proverbs 16:31, gray hair is a crown of glory it is gained in a righteous life. So if a man grows older and has walked with God and lived righteously, that person should be a fount of wisdom. He should be and should be respected. And that's basically what Aliyu is saying here. You see, as you grow older, you become more aware of the time you have left. And you begin to realize that the, the road in front of you is a lot shorter than the one you have behind you. And so when you become aware that your days are, are less now, it can help you to become more aware of what really matters and what really doesn't. When you're younger, you may think certain things. You may think that uh, a great education is a must. You may think that having a nice home in a certain area is a must. Driving a certain car is a must. Nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves, of course. But once you've accumulated things, once you have finished your education, once you have about the home, once you have about the car, once you have those things, you discover that they perish with the using. You discover that those things didn't make you wiser. They didn't give you better skills to live. They really didn't. They simply became things you possessed. And ultimately, sometimes, those things begin to possess you. So an older person begins to realize that there are certain things that matter. And as you grow older and older and closer to the time when you're going to close your eyes here to open them up in, in heaven and behold the face of the Lord, you become, to be, you become more aware of what life really is and what really does matter. You become aware of that. And that's one of the reasons why a young man may have a lot of zeal and a lot of fire and a lot of desire and great ideas. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I actually value those things. But that doesn't mean that, that I would look to the younger man as a fount of wisdom and experience. It doesn't mean that I would go to them with a problem. Well, I know you're yet to have any children, but can you give me advice for my grandchildren? It wouldn't work. How would I do that? Why would I do that? And see, so the way it works and has always worked is that with the age comes wisdom and understanding. And the Bible teaches us that that's an important thing. Again, as you grow older, you become more aware of the time you have left, and that helps us to determine what really matters in life. Psalm 90, verse 12 says it like this. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. You see, under ordinary circumstances, the younger would trust in the wisdom of the older. Now, when he says in verse 6, you are very old, you know, when he's speaking in that way to them, um, he's saying, you're old, and I was afraid of being presumptuous. I didn't want to speak because I should respect you. But, verse 8, there's a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. He goes on to say, great men, verse 9, are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. And that's a practical truth. There's a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. After listening to you speak, I see that age and experience don't make men wise. I see that spiritual wisdom is imparted from God, and spiritual wisdom is not naturally gained. Long life does not automatically ensure great wisdom. 
Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Psalm 119 verses 98 and 99 says, You through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. And so just because someone lives a long life, is basically what he's saying, doesn't automatically mean that they're wise. And so verse 9, again, great men. Great would also carry the, the connotation of age. Older men are not always wise, nor do the age always understand justice. Uh, men who have aged and have been educated or have wealth <laughs> are not always wise. If they have not sought God, they haven't gained true wisdom. That's why the godly person doesn't go to the ungodly for advice. We go to those who've known the Lord and have walked with the Lord. Because if a person hasn't sought God, they haven't gained true wisdom. In verse 10, he continues, he says, Therefore I say, listen to me, I also will declare my opinion. Indeed, I waited for your words. I listened to your reasonings while you searched out what to say. I paid close attention to you. And surely, not one of you convinced Job or answered his words. And so he's saying, I've been here. I've been listening to what you've had to say. Not one of you has been able to convince Job of his error. I've listened to your arguments, but not one of you was able to answer what he had to say. And so in verse 13, he says, lest you say we have found wisdom, God will vanquish him, not man. Now, he has not directed his words against me, so I will not answer him with your words. And so he's speaking concerning that in verse 13, and he's saying, lest you say we have found wisdom, I'm afraid that you will think that you have vanquished Job with your reasoning, but you haven't. The only one who can vanquish him is God, and you have failed. When he speaks in verse 14 and says, now he has not directed his words against me, I can deal with him because he hasn't spoken to me. He hasn't provoked my emotions. I've remained calm. I'm untouched by him and his argument. And therefore, I have different arguments that I want to present. And so I'm going to answer him, not with your words, but with my own. In verse 15, they are dismayed and answer no more. Words escape them. I've waited because they didn't speak, because they stood still and answered no more. I also will answer my part. I too will declare my opinion, for I'm full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Indeed, my belly, <laughs> this guy is very poetic. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It's ready to burst like new wineskins. I will speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. And so he goes on very poetically, and he's saying, listen, um, uh, I'm dismayed. There's no answer. Uh, words are escaping me. In other words, these men have, left, have been left with no answer. They don't know what to say. And so he's saying in verse 16, so I waited. I waited for you to respond. You haven't been able to do so. And since you haven't done a good job, I, I feel that I need to enter in now to this argument. And I'm filled with words. I, I have things that need to be expressed. Now, all of this, by the way, as we look at it, shows what has been called the impatience of youth. I can't hold back. I can't resist. I must speak. It shows the impatience of youth. He says in verse 17, you have given your opinion. Now it's my turn to speak. In verse 18, I have much to say. My spirit inside me is agitated. Verse 19, it feels like I'm going to explain. I can't hold back any longer. I need to speak. Verse 20, I have to get this off of my mind. <laughs> I need relief. And so he, he's sharing all these emotions he has and how he has to speak. And so in verses 21 and 22, when he says, Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man. I don't know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. He says, I'm going to tell you like it is. I'm not going to spare anybody's feelings. My fear of God will not allow me to mince words. I must say what needs to be said. I'm a young man filled with emotion, filled with experience, 
with different arguments. I've listened to you older men. I've come to realize just because you're old doesn't make you wise. Not one of you has been able to show Job the error of his ways. And, and seeing that you haven't, it's time to bring the big guns in. That's kind of what he's saying here. It's time for me to come in and step in where you guys couldn't complete the task. So this shows you something, and we'll see this. And I'm looking at the time, and I'm saying, God, you're the God of miracles. <laughs> I will stop at a, as a reasonable time and then just pick up if I need to. But I'm going to try and, and give this whole study. I don't know why I did this. <laughs> and so he goes on, verse 1, chapter 33. Please, Job. Hear my speech, listen to all my words. Now I open my mouth, my tongue speaks in my mouth. My words come from my upright heart. My lips utter pure knowledge. The spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. If you can answer me, set your words in order before me. Take your stand, truly. I am as your spokesman before God. I also have been formed out of clay. Surely no fear of me will terrify you, nor will my hand be heavy on you. Now, do you hear the arrogance? Can you hear it? Can you picture it? Can you picture a young man speaking to an older man like that? Now, maybe you can. Maybe you're a young person. And you think, yeah, yeah, he's saying it the way it should be said. Maybe you are. But see, when I was reading this, I understand this because I'm an old man. And I've had young men explain things to me. And it's not that they haven't got good points. You'll see that he does. But respect goes a long way. And when you speak to an elder, you speak to him as one would speak to a father, is what Paul said to Timothy. He said, speak to the older men. Speak to them like they're your father. Now, some people don't understand what that means because perhaps they didn't have a dad. Or maybe the father they had, they didn't respect. But see, I can't say that. I had a father, and I had a father I respected. And so I, I made my mistakes. I was the young man who spoke without respect on occasion. Not always, but on occasion. And now I'm the older man, and on occasion... I have had the younger man speak without respect. And I, so I was reading this and preparing this, and I was thinking, there's an arrogant tinge to the voice of Elihu as he's speaking. He's telling him, you know, stand up like a man. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to treat you gently. I'm going to speak to you, you know, in a way uh, it may be hard for you to take. But uh, listen, I may be young, um, and, and you may be, you may have personal feelings about me as in my youth, but I'm just asking, hear me out. Because, listen, I have considered my words. And I want you to know I have a pure heart when I speak. And so he starts, and I'll just touch the verses. In verse 2, he's basically saying, my tongue speaks uh, in my mouth. In other words, I have carefully considered what I should say. In verse 3, my words come from an upright heart. I'm speaking with complete sincerity. My lips will utter pure knowledge. I, I speak clearly. I state things just as they are, so there will be no misunderstanding. In verse 4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. That, that is why I'm speaking. And that is why, Job, that's why you should listen. You see, I have a right to be heard. After all, God made me too. He made you, but he also made me. So on one level, that's true. We're both made in God's image. But on a different level, Elihu's taking too much upon himself. Just because they're both believers doesn't make Elihu equal in wisdom or experience. And remember what God had said concerning Job when God said to Satan, there's no one like him. He is one of a kind. He is upright. He's righteous. He hates evil. This is the most upright man, and yet you have Elihu equating himself with Job. I've had young pastors who have had their church going for a year give me advice on how to run my church. I have had <laughs> young pastors who came to a pastor's conference 
We're at the conference, wrote on Facebook and other social media. Well, we're at the Calvary Chapel conference. I wish these dinosaurs would get out of the way so the younger men could lead. And so I slapped him. You just <laughs> emotionally do who you want to. That's an attitude that we've encountered. I've encountered that. Get out of the way. I'm equal to you. I've got experience too. But I think you take too much upon yourself, Elihu. In verses 5 through 7, if you can answer me, set your words in order. Take your stand. My wisdom is about to humble you. But if you think you can answer me, well, prepare to. And when he says in verse 6, uh, truly I am your spokesman before God, I'm the answer to your request. Well, remember, Job in chapter 9, verse 33, had said, if only there were someone to arbitrate between us to lay his hand upon us both. He's saying, I am the answer to your prayer, Job. I'm the one. I'm your spokesman. In verse 7, surely no fear of me will terrify you, nor will my hand be heavy on you. I'm going to take it easy on you as I correct you. Do you see the arrogance in that? There's a lot of arrogance. Humility goes a long way when you correct somebody. Surely, verse 8, surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words saying, I'm pure without transgression. I'm innocent. There's no iniquity in me. Yet he finds occasion, occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. So at, the, at this point, he begins to paraphrase what he believes that he's heard Job say. In verse 9, for example, you are saying that you're pure with no transgressions and, and that you're innocent. Well, in chapter 10, verse 7, it reads, you know that I am not guilty, and no one can rescue me from your hand. In verse 10, he says, yet you find occasion against me. In other words, you count me as an enemy. Well, in Job 13, 24, the question was asked, why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? In chapter 16, verse 9, God assails me and tears me in his anger, gnashes his teeth at me. So he's simply repeating what he's heard. In verse 11, he puts my feet in stocks and, and watches all my paths. Well, in Job 13, 27, he said that, you fasten my feet in shackles. In verse 11, he, he watches all my paths. Well, in chapter 19, verse 8, he's blocked my way so I cannot pass. He shrouded my path in darkness. And so he's speaking and repeating to him what he has said. When he says in verse 12 and 13, look, in this you are not righteous, I'll answer you. God is greater than man. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of any of his words. Well, this is what's wrong with you. <laughs> You're only a sinner. You see, God is not only greater in might and majesty, but God is also greater in justice. And so you're wrong. You're wrong in contending with him. You have failed to, to show him reverence. And that alone reveals you're a sinner. And that shows that you deserve what you're going through. He says in verse 13, well, why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of any of his words. God doesn't owe you any explanations concerning what he does or why he does it. And by the way, that is true. Isaiah 45 verse 9 says, woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. No. So what he's saying, there's, so, there's truth to that, obviously. You're contending with him, but he owes you no explanation. Verse 14, God may speak in one way or in another, yet man doesn't perceive it in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds. He opens the ears of men, seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. This, is, this stuff is very interesting. God is his own way, he's saying, of speaking to man. Yet often man doesn't hear it. Often man doesn't perceive it. God reveals himself, and we know that. How does God reveal himself? Well, God reveals himself through conscience. 
Your conscience can accuse you or excuse you. There, in other words, there are things you know that are right and there are things you know are wrong. And when you do something that you know is wrong, your conscience accuses you. So God uses conscience. There's something within man that tells us there is something that is proper and something that is not proper. God also reveals himself in creation. You know, every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. The heavens declare your glory. So you can see creation and you can say that there is creation. Therefore, there must be a creator because houses don't just explode into existence. There was a designer, an architect, a builder. This all went together through the efforts of some mind and then the efforts of someone with strength. And so God uses conscience. He awakens us to the reality of what is wrong. Doesn't necessarily save you, but it makes you aware that there are things that are wrong. And two, creation, because you can look out there and you can say, there's no way that this could just have happened and all. But he also uses his prophets. God used the prophets to speak forth his mind and declare himself to man. God reveals himself in a variety of ways. But notice what he says in verse 15. He says, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, he opens the ears of men, seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. That's an interesting thing. Again, remember, this is the oldest written book, and this is the oldest book in terms of events that are transcribed for us, taking place during the time of Abraham and a little bit after. Moses came later, and he collated these things and wrote it down. (laughs) And that's where you get the first five books of the Bible. So what we have is ancient wisdom. And he's saying uh, that God, and this is interesting, I'll say this quickly, that God uses dreams. That's what he's saying. He says it again, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. God uses dreams. Does he always use dreams? We'll look at that for a moment in just a second. But read your Bible. In Acts chapter, rather in, uh, in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 15, God revealed himself through a dream to Abraham. Jacob had a dream of a ladder to heaven in Genesis 28. Joseph had a dream that his family would bow before him in Genesis 37. Solomon had a dream when God said, ask of me anything. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Joseph, Mary's husband, had a dream that Mary's pregnancy was of God. And later, he had a dream that instructed him to go to Egypt. You can multiply these many times in Scripture. God used dreams. And can it happen to this day, someone's asking? Well, there are people asleep in this room right now. I hope he is. (laughs) It's an, there's an interesting scripture. It's found in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That was a prophecy found out in the book of Job, or rather in, in the book of Joel chapter 2, that is spoken of in the book of Acts chapter 2 after the day of Pentecost. So God used dreams. Can he still use dreams? He does. I have no doubt that he does. Um, does, Is that his normal way is a different question, and the answer is no. What is his normal way of communicating? His normal way of communicating is through the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But God had a variety of ways in which he chose to reveal himself. When you read the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So God used a variety of ways. These ways are being spoken of here in the book of Job in verses 15 following to verse 18. But God's normal way of revealing himself in our day is through his word and by his spirit. So that ought to give you some comfort because sometimes you may have this dream and you wake up saying, oh, my God, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, my wife, my wife's going to have a horse's head. No, that 
No, that's not the Lord. So you always use the word of God. You always use it. I better hurry. Verse 19. A man is also chastened with pain on his bed, with strong pain in many of his bones, so that his life abhors bread, his soul succulent food. His flesh wastes away from sight. His bones stick out, which once were not seen. Yes, his soul draws near the pit and his life to the executioners. Affliction. God uses a variety of ways, but Job, he also uses affliction. God speaks through pain when his warnings in other ways are ignored. It's been said, I believe it was C.S. Lewis. I may be wrong. I think C.S. Lewis said God is that that pain is God's megaphone that gets our attention. In Psalm 119, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept your word. Psalm 119, verse 71, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. It's good for me to have gone through tough times because I've learned how to live a life that pleases you. And affliction, pain, sometimes is the way the Lord has used life in our, in our circumstances to communicate himself clearly. One of the things that many of us have seen in the recent times has been how God has used our circumstances, our present circumstances, to actually purge us and refine us in the COVID situation and all the misinformation and disinformation and the fear and other things that people deal with now Many of us have had our faith refined. So we've come to believe deeper the essential things, to trust more in, in areas that, that at one time perhaps we were weak in. And I've seen that. I've seen how the Lord can use affliction. I, I've seen how, how his word where it says, all things shall work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, how that scripture in Romans 8, 28, how that comes alive. How, how I, I can say, now, wait a minute, how can all things mix together? How can they all work out to be good? Because these things that I'm going through right now and this series of things that I've experienced recently, these are things that seem to be tearing me down. They're not building me up. And the Lord is saying, no, didn't you pray in a certain way that you wanted to know me in a deeper way? Didn't you pray that? And then if you're honest, perhaps you haven't. And in my case, yes, Lord, I have. I have said I want to know you. I've said I want to know your ways. I've said I want to be like you. Well, what do you think? The process to be like me and to know me is what you're going through right now. I'm answering your prayer. You say, well, then you know what? I really don't want that prayer answered, you know. Or you say, thank you, Lord, that's exactly right. Because the deeper the cut, the greater the healing. And I want to be deep. I want to be deep with you. I want to know you. And he said, and this is how you'll learn me. And so, yes, pain can be God's megaphone. Am I saying let's pray for pain? No, it comes. I don't have to ask for it. What I ask for is the strength to not only endure, but to learn, and then to grow wiser, to be able to help those who go through the same path. So the Lord uses these things. He says to us that he uses them. Someone once said, the Lord does not measure out our afflictions according to our faults, but according to our strength, and looks not, what we, at, what we, and looks not at what we have deserved, but what we are able to bear. In verse 23, he says, if there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand to show man his uprightness, then he's gracious to him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Job, you need an intermediary, someone to deliver you. When it speaks in verse 24 and says he's gracious to him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit, I have found a ransom. It's been said this is a prefigurement of Messiah. This is foretelling, if you will, God's grace through Jesus Christ, the one who is going to deliver. In verse 24, that word deliver is a Hebrew word that can also be translated redeem. 
And the idea in the word redeem is to purchase and set free. And that's what Jesus Christ did for us, guys, as he redeemed us. He purchased us. The book of Ephesians says it like this in chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Redemption. The way the word can be used speaks of going into a, um, into a marketplace and during this day, slaves would be sold, and someone could purchase the slave, and that slave becomes property of the owner. And what God has done is he went into the marketplace, if you will, where we were slaves to sin and in bondage to Satan. And God paid the redemption price, and now we belong to him. He purchased us with the blood of Christ, and when he purchased us, he set us free. You know, during that day, someone may have bought a slave and then brought him home to work for him, not, not, not our Savior. He bought us so that we could be set free. So as bond slaves, voluntary servants, we would serve him with all that we have out of gratitude because of his purchasing us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so what he's speaking about here is this mediator. He's speaking about a desire to have one who has been a ransom. It says in verse 25, his flesh shall be young like a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray to God and he will delight in him. He shall see his face with joy for he restores to man his righteousness. Then he looks at men and says, I've sinned and perverted what was right. It did not profit me. He will redeem his soul from going down to the pit and his life shall see the light. Behold, God works all these things twice, in fact, three times with a man to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Give ear, Job, listen to me. Hold your peace and I'll speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Hold your peace. I'll teach you wisdom. Mm. <laughs> and it says in verses 25 and 26, his flesh shall be young like a child. The one who's redeemed will recover. Strength will return. Joy will overflow. His relationship with God will be restored. His prayers will be answered. He's reconciled to God. He'll be made righteous. In verses 27 and 28, he looks at men and says, I've sinned and perverted what is right. While God looks at the one who admits his sin, the one who humbly confesses it, and when a sinner says, I've perverted what is right, it didn't profit me, it reveals that he truly is repenting. And in verse 28, the result is going to be salvation. In verses 29 and 30, he said, God works in all of these things twice, in fact, three times with a man. God often works through visions and chastenings. Sometimes it, makes, it takes two or even three, but he uses them to bring him back. Well, he does this to bring men to a right relationship with him. That's why Proverbs 3, 11, and 12 would apply, where it says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And then finally, in verses 31 through 33, Give ear, Job. Listen to me. Hold your peace. I'll speak. Listen to my wisdom. It will benefit I am a great source of wisdom. Don't put a lid on me. There's a little arrogance there. Hold your peace and I'll teach you wisdom. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Maybe I'm a grumpy old man, but that wouldn't sit right with me. But anyway, he's not through. He's got a few other things to see to say, and we'll look at those when we get back. But Let's close with the idea of that, that, that what he said is right, that God is going to bring a ransom, that God redeems. There is a mediator. It isn't Elihu, it's Jesus Christ. God has purchased us. We belong to him. He took us out of the marketplace of sin. He set us free. He has given us joy, and in that we should serve him. And those things are true. Let's close with those things. And, Father, we bless you. And we thank you for how you work in our lives. And Lord, some of these things 
are things that are absolutely correct and therefore we should listen. But help us, Lord, also to learn what respect is and learn how to bring correction. For sometimes we may have not been the kind of person we should have been when we tried to help someone and restore them. So, Lord, as we look at this, and there's so much to see, I pray that whatever it is that we needed to hear today that would help us, I pray that we've received that. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there may be some right now, perhaps in this room or online, who need to get right with the Lord and you need prayer. Perhaps you even need to be redeemed. And if that's the case, or whatever the case, and you need prayer, I would like to pray for you before we close. And if you need prayer, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why these hands are raised to you. You know exactly why. And Lord, I ask that you would just move in each, in each heart that is being represented right now. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. And as we yield to you, change us from the inside. Lord, we give you praise for this. We thank you. We turn to you. Thank you for Jesus. And we will serve him. So we give you praise. And we thank you for the work that you are performing in us. And we give you thanks for this. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. Jesus, I pray you keep moving in all of us. In your name, amen.